没有。Good morning, everyone. Hey, I'm I'm Deb, and I thought we could worship. <laughs> It's good to see all of you today. We're still bringing in chairs from the fellowship space. And someone can have mine if you need it, and there are some others upstairs if we need those. So. You don't have to stand. Although, if you want to, if you just feel like jumping up and down and you know shouting and whatnot, feel free. But you might be the only one.、Um, it's it's good to be here. I missed you all last week. I was at a another church convention. <laughs> so I'll tell you more about that later. Um, and and I am aware that I, as I came in this morning, about five people stopped me to tell me massive things that are going on in their lives that need prayer. Seriously, we are a people in need of prayer today. So I am so glad that we are community for one another.、Um, I will share with our care team things that some of you have already shared with me. Let's talk after worship. And、uh, and when we get to the prayers of the people, please know that there is time to name whoever you know in need of of prayer.、Um, <clears throat> prayers of Thanksgiving are also welcome too. Those don't seem to be the ones we're focused on this morning, but、um, anything that needs prayer can be lifted up during that time. If you are visiting with us this morning, we are so glad. It is so good to have people here and welcome.、Um, if you are if you're here for the first time, if we've not met before, then I'm especially pleased to see you and hope that we'll have time to exchange names and you know whatnot after worship to say hi in person. Um, and I will also tell you that you caught me on a really weird preaching day, so、um, so sorry about that.、Um, I, okay, church convention—that's where I was, so that adds something to it. And then I got a cat bite, which led to a tetanus shot, which led to well, never mind.、Um, so this sermon is like anyway. <laughs> What? Spirit led. The spirit led. That's right. Spirit led. I take zero responsibility for it. <laughs> anyway, welcome, welcome to Woodside.、Um, we do have some announcements before worship.、Um, Tom said he's changing something. <laughs> I, I, I am actually. The first song,、uh, if you notice. The words we are very familiar with. However, the tune that's printed in the in the worship bulletin this morning is not something that any of us, I think, are familiar with.、Uh, so we will sing the familiar tune, but just be aware if you read music, that is not the music that's printed there. <laughs> so, just I, I, will, I will take responsibility for this. I sent Hunter the files, the the images for our songs. And forgot that we had two versions of this, and I was in a hurry to get out of town, see church convention above, and、um, and I did not double check to make sure I sent the right one. So that is my fault, and thank you. That's okay. My apologies to you all. Anything else we need to know? Did you change anything else while I was gone? I did not. Okay.、Um, our last song is two pages, and we hate. We hate flipping pages in the middle of a song, but that's just the way it goes. So the the good news is, once you flip to the back page, you don't have to flip back again. <laughs> so one through three, chorus, 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 flip, four chorus, easy. So sorry about that, but it's a nice song, and I think you'll enjoy singing it.、Um, and. I don't know. That's that's pretty much all we need to get through worship at the same time, right?、Um, I do want to tell you, especially if you're visiting with us, that 
that we have Holy Communion here every week. We share bread and wine, gluten-free bread, which now I know, because um, I, I read something yesterday that may or may not be reliable, but apparently gluten allergies may really be an, an allergy to Roundup, which they spray the wheat with and so many other things. So I'm not saying eat the bread. I'm just saying that we have so much to learn about how Monsanto and others are poisoning us. But we have gluten-free bread, and that, sorry, that was a tangent, and alcohol-free wine. And this is a meal that is, uh, we celebrate this as God's gift to us, a gift of community, a gift of strength for the journey, a gift of sacred moment. So, so all you have to be to come and eat is hungry. This meal is for whoever would like to participate in this meal of grace. So when we get to that moment, please, please feel free to come to the table. We receive the bread, a um, little bit, piece of bread, and then we dip it in the cup. So you can certainly participate if you choose. I don't know anything else, literally. So, so again, welcome. Welcome to Woodside. Whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here at Woodside Church. So please stand, would you, and join me in the call to worship. Christ is in our midst. We roll the doors to our hearts, minds, and spirits. When God shows up, surprising things can happen. We will lay down our burdens and set aside our distractions. Here we receive good news. Nothing is too wonderful for God. So let us have the same. Let us pray. Gracious God, we greet you once again in this sacred space. We have come because we need to be reminded of your love and your expectation for our living. We are like the vine you planted, watered, protected. We know in our hearts that we want, need, and desire your presence in our lives. So we come in prayer to listen for your word, to speak truth to our hearts. Reveal again to us your desires for us. Amen. Let's join together in our first song, We Cannot Own the Sunlit Sky. We cannot own the sunlit sky, the moon and wildflowers growing. We are part of all that is within life's river flowing. With hope and hands we see them share It's God's creation That all may have abundant life In every earthly nation When bodies shiver in the night Weary with the morning When children have no bread but tears Genesis. So God said to Abraham, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is terrible, and their sin is so grave that I must go down and see for myself. 
If they have done what her cry against them accused them of, I will destroy them. If not, I need to know that, too. While the travelers walked along toward Sodom, Abraham remained in God's presence. Then Abraham drew closer and said, Will you sweep away the innocent and the guilty? Suppose there were 50 innocent people in the city. Would you wipe out that place rather than spare it for the sake of the 50 innocent within it? Far be it from you to do such a thing to make the innocent die with the guilty. Should the innocent and the guilty be treated the same way? Heaven forbid it. Shouldn't the judge of the earth act with justice? God replied, If I find 50 innocent people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham spoke up again. See how I presume to speak to my sovereign, though I am only dust and ashes. What if there are 45 innocent people? Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of those five? I will not destroy it, God answered, if I find 45 there. Abraham persisted and said, what if only 40 are found there? God replied, for the sake of 40, I will not destroy it. Then Abraham said, let not my sovereign grow impatient if I go on. What if only 30 are found there? God replied, for the sake of 30, I will not destroy it. Still, Abraham went on, since I have thus dared to speak to my sovereign, what if there are no more than 20? For the sake of 20, I will not destroy it, God answered. Abraham persisted. Please do not be angry if I speak up this last time. What if there are only 10 there? For the sake of the 10, God replied, I will not destroy it. Thus ends the reading. A reading from the Gospel of Luke. One day, Jesus was praying, and when he had finished, one of his disciples asked, Rabbi, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Abba, God, hallowed be your name. May your reign come. Give us today tomorrow's bread. Forgive us our sins. For we too forgive everyone who sins against us. And don't let us be subjected to the test. Jesus said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, a neighbor, and you go to your neighbor at midnight and say, Lend me three loaves of bread. Because friends of mine on a journey have come to me, and I have nothing to set before them. Then your neighbor says, Leave me alone. The door is already locked, and the children and I are in bed. I can't get up and look after your needs. I tell you, though your neighbor will not get up to give you the bread out of friendship, your persistence will make your neighbor get up and give you as much as you need. That's why I tell you, keep asking and you'll receive. Keep looking and you'll find. Keep knocking and the door will be open to you. For whoever asks, receives. Whoever seeks, finds. Whoever knocks is admitted. What parents among you will give a snake to their child when the child asks for a fish? Or a scorpion when the child asks for an egg? If you, with all your sins, know how to give your children good things, how much more will our heavenly Abba give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? This ends the reading.
back in the day when body shaming was still an acceptable form of conversation, I had a friend who was a pastor, now a Bible scholar and professor, who had a bumper sticker on his car that said this, I may be fat, but you're ugly and I can diet. <laughs> Which could prompt any number of conversations. <laughs> like, what is beauty anyway? And why would we have ever thought it okay to comment on someone's body shape? But also, if you accept the premise of the bumper sticker, it raises questions like, what is immutable and what is changeable? What are we stuck with? What can we count on and what, what do we do with the rest? Which may have a couple of things to do with our lesson this morning, the one from Genesis. And I'll just tell you that this sermon is not all that satisfying and does not lead to a comforting conclusion. So if you would rather go pour coffee and chat in the other room, I completely understand. In this reading, God has a plan to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, surely for reasons we don't expect, but we'll get to that in a minute. And Abraham changes God's mind. There are a lot of people in the world who would cringe at the notion that God's mind can be changed. So this reading may be particularly challenging, especially since changing our minds is often about having not had enough information to start with, which somehow suggests God doesn't know everything, and we may have something to contribute to the conversation. And isn't that an unsettling thought, that God needs information that we have and God doesn't? Unsettling, perhaps, or very freeing, or both. So this is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. You've likely heard of them, and probably in the context of someone telling you how gay people are all going to hell. But that is not accurate. That is not even close. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah involves male visitors to these twin cities, visitors who are treated with suspicion by the men of the town, who demand these male strangers be handed over by their host so that we may know them, says the reading, so that we may know them, which is Bible speak for having sex. The men of the town intend to sexually assault the male visitors to exercise power over them. The host refuses to turn them over. He offers, the host offers his virgin daughter instead, but they are all spared when the guests turn out to be angels, which is usually a nice little turn of events. A similar story is told in the book of Judges about the town of Gibeah. In that story, the men of the town likewise storm the house demanding, demanding to sexually assault the male guests. The householder again offers his virgin daughter, along with a female guest in his home, the male visitor's concubine, which is a female servant with sexual duties, a role often forced on women living in poverty who have few options. So she, the concubine, is actually thrown out the door to the men in the story as if they were hungry wild animals she is gang raped throughout the night until she dies. These are not gay love stories. They are stories of violence and power, just as rape is always about violence and power. And the people who use the stories as warnings against gay relationships are either disingenuous or abysmally misinformed. Hospitality is a core value in the stories of Israel and the stories of Jesus, and raping male visitors just does not measure up. Raping female visitors appears to be okay, 
which has to make us wonder at least for a minute why there are any women at all in any churches anywhere. In other scripture readings, the so-called sin of Sodom is defined in two ways, as violence toward people seeking refuge and as being overfed and unconcerned when people are poor and hungry. But you see why we have to make it about gay people because otherwise we would have to change the way we approach poverty and immigration. So that's one thing. Sodom and Gomorrah are not about sexuality, except insofar as sex is so often used as a weapon. The requirement of hospitality is so very important that God sees what has happened here and intends to destroy the city. How dare they treat strangers this way? And you have to imagine God is asking the same question of America circa 2019. How dare they treat strangers this way? And then there's Abraham. Abraham is called the model of faith. And though I'm not a fan, in this case, I guess I have to hope he is successful. He is either self-assured enough to challenge God's idea and prevail, or someone told this story about him because they were nominating him to be father of a religion, and you need stories like this on your resume. <laughs> so Abraham intervenes. Wait, he says, there might be some good people there. Maybe in a city of thousands, there might be as many as 50 good people. But even if there are only 10, shouldn't that be enough to keep God from destroying them all? Why risk harming 10 good people? And surely he means 10 good men, since women seem not to be on his radar of world population, which annoys me all the more. On their behalf, Abraham bargains with God which sounds a little comical as we read it, but which also reads as boldness of prayer. Some years ago, a congregation I served in Washington, D.C. during the apartheid era, we had a guest preacher who was from South Africa. She talked about how very painful it was to experience her children lacking food she said she and other parents, black people living in this apartheid system, would cry out to God, demanding accountability. Are we your children or what are we? She would cry out. And they would mourn in their prayers. My own prayer life seems to ebb and flow, I guess. I lean toward praise and thanksgiving, less toward intercession and intervention. But today's stories, both of them seem to nudge us toward shameless petitions, begging, insisting, pleading, as if we can see things God cannot and we have an opportunity to point God's attention to something that may have escaped divine notice. Wait, there are good people about to be hurt. But that hasn't saved the Sudanese or Rohingya people from genocide. It didn't save 200,000 people from death by opioid overdose. It did not save this nation from the travesty of the Trump administration. It did not end Jim Crow, either the old one or the new one. It, it arguably did not end apartheid or the Holocaust. It has not saved us from the ongoing endlessness of gun deaths in this country. Throughout human history, there have been people begging God to deliver in some way. And yet evil keeps on happening, which may explain my different approach. Praise and thanksgiving, but not really asking for much. Jesus tells us to pray for daily bread. Or maybe he's asking us to pray for tomorrow's bread. The original is unclear. Give us today bread for tomorrow, it may say. Plus, we have to remember that this was Luke somebody writing several decades after Jesus' death to encourage the growing movement. 
Pray for bread, Luke Jesus said, which I find hypocritical to do when I clearly have more bread than I need. But also pray for the reign of God to come, he says, which I do, but I also believe that praying involves working. And perhaps I have been jaded by far too many non-religious people offering thoughts and prayers when what was really needed was better legislation. So in the story of Abraham, if I were Abraham, it is possible I would more likely want to be the one sorting the righteous from the unrighteous instead of the one drafting the prayers of deliverance. This past week, at yet another church convention, this time for the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, where I was mostly consigned to the exhibit hall on behalf of Urban Spirit, the poverty education program that you all are gracious enough to let me continue directing. I had some really good conversations about poverty and related themes. And then I had a conversation with a woman about racism. In a, in a tone that sort of said, ain't it awful, she said that in her town, someone had taken an American flag and written in the white stripes, send her home, send her back. A tribute, of course, to our racist president who has made that his new campaign chant and his racist followers who quit thinking for themselves a while ago. I asked the woman how her church responded to this. She hedged. They're a small church, she said, only eight of them, really. To which I responded that it did not take eight people to respond to this. Plus, Jesus only had 12 disciples, and so eight of them could surely do something. No, she said they couldn't, and she offered several other reasons. The conversation went on for a few minutes, and finally I told her that her church ought to go ahead and die instead of taking up space in the community. <laughs> I'm going to say that more often to some other churches, too. Then, during my long drive when that event was done, that was in Des Moines, at one point a song came on my iPod, a Melissa Etheridge song that I had not heard in a while, a tribute to Matthew Shepard called Scarecrow. Matthew Shepard, you may remember, was a, a young gay man killed by homicidal homophobes 21 years ago and just buried finally last year at the National Cathedral in Washington. He was tied to a fence, beaten, tortured, and abandoned. He was found barely alive, but died several days later of his injuries. In recounting that horror, Melissa sings, we all gasp. This can't happen here. We're all much too civilized. Where can these monsters hide? But they're knocking on our front door. They're rocking in our cradles. They're preaching in our churches. They're eating at our tables. They're preaching at our churches. And I was reminded of the very substantial support that Trump's racism, misogyny, homophobia, and xenophobia get from churches that claim to follow Jesus. The church has a reputation problem, wrote Myers, and Melissa's song bears it out. And my observation is that that reputation is quite well deserved. They're preaching in their churches, or sitting in the pews doing nothing whilst the murderers rage. So yes, I would volunteer to separate the righteous from the unrighteous. And I told my colleague in the exhibit hall that I decided the book I will write someday, this has been a, you know, a 30 year choosing a title. <laughs> the book I decided I will write someday will be called, I don't care if your church dies. I don't expect to sell any copies. <laughs> But then I listened to myself, and I realized I'm probably a little less like Abraham and a little more like Jonah. Remember Jonah? 
God told Jonah to go preach to Nineveh to tell them all to repent. And Jonah ran away instead, got swallowed by the big fish, because he did not want God to forgive Nineveh. When God forgave Nineveh, Jonah said, I knew this would happen. When Nineveh repented, Jonah was just resentful. That's how I feel sometimes, especially when it comes to a particular subset of American lawmakers, voters, and corporate executives, which is my own work of repentance, I suppose. Abraham advocated for a whole city based on the possibility that not everyone living there was awful, which was the right thing to do, but not very satisfying to imagine that these vile people get a pass to continue their brutalizing ways, to get, that they get to continue pillaging and looting. Maybe you're deciding at this moment that I'm a goner that any aura of holiness you may once have assigned to me, which might have been delusional, has now been completely tarnished. And maybe that's true. But I would bet my very last Harriet Tubman that the congregation, <laughs> that the congregation that did nothing to counter the racist act in its community actually prays more weeks than not for God to end racism. And I ask, what is the church's role? Though I'm not a fan and I have some serious issues with Abraham, I am challenged by him in this. He shows us that the role of people of faith is to advocate for the innocent ones. Even if it means accepting that grace is given to the ones who are violent towards strangers, unconcerned for those living in poverty, unwelcoming of immigrants. The reign of God has come near, Jesus said just a couple of weeks ago, and he taught us that that is to be our message. That is our message, just the same to the ones who welcome and the ones who do not welcome. The reign of God has come near. And today, in this prayer, Jesus teaches his disciples, a prayer which Christians use in some form or other all around the world, Jesus betrays Uses, uses language that betrays a political edge that we don't usually acknowledge. He uses the word Abba, which does not mean daddy, as some say, as, as if in a family relationship or tenderness or to prop up the patriarchy, but father, which was commonly used for political leaders, like George Washington was the father of our country. Jesus is calling God by a political title and then saying, praying, your reign come, which is also a political thing, given that he lives in a world that already has a king with a reign. Jesus, says Levine, is coaching the disciples to cry out for a different kind of world. This prayer is resistance. It is a prayer for courage to align ourselves with God's reign breaking in. Jesus teaches the disciples to pray a prayer of defiance of the emperor. God is doing something, and we should pray to be part of it rather than being part of the hot mess that we're living in. If we do join in this alternate vision, we are compelled by a nonviolent Jesus who said that wheat and chaff should be allowed to continue together until such time as God sorts it out. But we are challenged to consider how we absolutely must call out the evil and counter it every chance we get, in every way that we can. We cannot war our way to a better world, but we can certainly resist the urge to vote for evil, to let it sit at the highest tables or stand with its fingers on the, on the powers of world destruction. We can refuse to look the other way when the stock market is good and prices are low, despite the horror that fills the daily lives of workers and refugees and people who are enslaved. And surely, we can allow unrighteous people to go on living without affording them the opportunity to keep doing evil. Can't we do that? Yeah. Being pe 
people who graciously pray that God would spare a city on behalf of ten innocent ones does not let us off the hook of resisting the evil ones. And it does not shed us of the responsibility to know the story and then call out the ones who turn Sodom and Gomorrah into something that is not. Those who twist the Bible inside out in order to deflect attention from their own wickedness. Franklin Graham, I'm talking to you. Jerry Falwell Jr., Mike Pence, you guys, and so many others. When I read this story from Genesis, I think of the burning bush that compelled Moses. And all of those times that he spent on the mountain with God, and people said his, his face changed. Folks believed that you could not look at God and live. But Abraham, ages before Moses, approached God fearlessly, like standing close enough to the divine fire that his eyebrows got singed. And it makes me wonder if God is actually a fire that we run into on behalf of someone else. And how would we choose for whom we would risk our life or our eyebrows? So I find myself back at the bumper sticker premise. Questions about what is immutable and what is changeable. If even God's mind can be changed, can the character of evil people be changed? I read the constant news of our federal government and I wonder, can Trump be changed? Can McConnell be changed? I am so loath to pray for them. Sorry as I am to admit that out loud. I listened this week to reports of the opioid crisis again and the intentional, gleeful distribution of millions of pills by manufacturers who knew people were getting addicted, who wrote emails about how addicted people were and how good that was for business. 200,000 people dead in this country and they are greedily rubbing their hands together awaiting payday. Are these people salvageable? I listen to the reports of evangelical leaders who have been Trump's cheerleaders for three years, so-called Christians who defend his racist taunts, his misogynistic policies, his lies and offenses, but who confess this week that what bothered him, what bothered them in his recent speech was not the chant of send her back, but the fact that he said God damn twice. Are these people salvageable? And churches that cannot be bothered to open their mouths when they are close enough to the rhetoric of racism to feel the spit on their faces, are they salvageable? Are we all stuck? Am I stuck in my unwillingness? Are we worth having someone step into the fire of God's face to beg grace on our behalf? And why, for God's sake, why does God have to be talked into things? Talked into things or talked down from things? What does it mean to believe in a God that cannot see the whole picture? A God who has such a knee-jerk reaction to the people of the world. The story of Sodom demands a litmus test of righteousness. And it also offers us one. Reflected in the words of every single prophet. Welcome immigrants, show hospitality, concern yourself for those living in poverty, and resist the notion that empire can be trusted. And these rules apply to every living being. If we start there, we will have put in a pretty good day. And the fact that we too sometimes have to be talked into these things is a good indication that things can change, that we can change. Perhaps then this is the crux of a resurrected life, a life of resistance, a life of welcome, a life of redistribution, a life of speaking up, even to God. I find it to be not as personally satisfying as a divine shakeout of good versus evil, perhaps, but it is the only way that we can live the vision that is before us. So I commend to us a life of faith, faith that does something, 
faith that works, faith that hopes, unsettling perhaps, or freeing, or both. Amen. Please join me in our statement of faith. We believe in God. God loves all people. God is with us in life, in death, in life beyond death. We are not alone. We believe in the teachings of Jesus. It is the responsibility of our church to promote within each individual the spirit of God and the teachings of Jesus. The church has a responsibility to the community, and our faith is a pattern for action. We believe worship is expressed in many forms, in prayer, music, and meditation. Spiritual development is a never-ending process. We believe in By coming together in Christian fellowship, we renew our spiritual energy. Our faith is demonstrated by a dynamic response to changing times. We are a hope, welcoming, affirming congregation, accepting its full life and ministry of our church, all persons, including those of every race, culture, age, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, ability, and economic circumstance. At this time, our diversity strengthens our faith. Our actions are a reflection of our Christian faith. Let us offer our prayers to God. Sing, O God, giver of love, receive our prayer. O God, we praise the strength of your love. Where there is hunger, raise up your love where there is hurt and persecution, empower your love. O God, give your love, receive our prayer. Where nations are angry and plot harm against one another, bring your love. Where a government does not seek the welfare of all of its people, bring your love. Where power destroys what you have made, bring your love. Where our fears keep us from offering aid to all the needy peoples, bring your love. Where there is division and jealousy, bring your love. O oh God, give your love, receive our prayer. O oh God, increase our affection, increase our compassion, increase our joy. Heal those who are sick, those who are known only to you, and those we now name. Thomas and Jefferson family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Where there is pain, bring your love. O oh God, bring your love to see our prayer. O oh God, we thank you for the power of divine love and for the presence of your love in one another. Make us holy, make us whole, and through us bring healing to your world. Yes, in your most righteous name. People of God, we have come to that part of our worship when we are invited to respond with thanksgiving to God's provisions for us. We have an opportunity to participate with God in the care of God's people. A part of our giving this past week uh, made it possible for four families to stay in their homes rather than be evicted. Of course, there's thousands that need that assistance. Let our love of God lead us to generosity for the sake of those who need our help. stand and sing together. What have we to offer? What have we to share? Coins from the copper, hearts filled with care. God will not falter, so let us dare. Lay it at the altar. participate with you in the building of your realm among us. Accept these gifts as a sign 
of our love for you and for our neighbors.
stand in 